um, the Sardis Baptist Virtual Meeting House. Uh, it looks like that we will continue to be meeting this way for a while based on recent news. So I am grateful that so many of you have embraced this way of connecting with one another and with us. So thank you for your participation and for keeping Sardis a place of corporate worship, even when we're scattered. Um, Last week, I reported that we were saving for our fourth Goodness Grocery delivery, and now I'd like to share that we are saving for our fifth. So truly, I believe what we're doing through this project is being God's hands and feet in the world, and we are all grateful for your continued support, and the school and the families are certainly thankful for your generosity. Um, for those of you who were not able to join us for Sardis Trivia last week, Team Stillerman won the prize, and that was a $25 donation to a charity of their choice, and they chose Goodness Groceries. Um, Friends of Sardis have also offered their support to the Migrant Assistance Project, and they are also working to feed food insecure children. So if you would like to support that project or learn more about it, please reach out to Betty Guns. Um, she um, has been working with that project for a long time now and can get you in touch with who you would need to get in touch with to assist. Uh, also, last week I mentioned Care Ring, which is a nonprofit locally that helps provide health care for uninsured folks. And one of the ways that they do that is through their low cost clinic, which offers um, care, pr primary care for, for those who don't have access to it otherwise. And our fellowship team this week is going to be preparing and delivering a meal for the nurses and physicians and other staff of. The clinic that week and we wanted you to know that was happening. Um, this Wednesday night will be the final week of Tim's Bible study, Faith and Resilience in Times of Crisis, and the topic this week is Seeing Resurrection, and we will be looking at readings from 2nd Isaiah. These writings invite us to live into God's new thing, which has resurrected old things, not as they were, but as they will be. Um, what timely message what a timely message for this and, and, and the messages that we've received through this study. So it sounds like this week might help us prepare for what is to become our new normal. Uh, the adult Sunday school will also begin a new study. Um, Learning to Walk in the Dark is the name of the book that we're going to read. It's written by Barbara, Down -Taylor, Barbara Brown Taylor. And if you would like more information or details about ordering the book, check your email um, from Sardis Baptist, or you can just reach out to one of the one of us staff members and we will um, get that information to you. Today, you will see some photos during worship and they're photos that have been shared by Sardis friends as a way to honor Mother Earth and to show appreciation. So if you would like to share photos and haven't yet, please post them with the hashtag Sardis Spring 2020, or you can just email the photos to the church and we will share them for you. Uh, we'll continue during worship for the next few weeks to share the photos that you've submitted to us. Um, there are plenty of other things happening right now, but I don't want to infringe on our worship time together. So please watch for your emails and check out our Facebook page. Um, let us now reflect for a moment on the symbols of our faith as we enter worship. The cross, representing God's love for all of humanity. The Bible, representing God's word and God's truth. And the flame, representing God's light in the world and reminding us that when times feel dark, divine presence is with us. And lastly, our worship window, uh, which represents creation and all that it is. So as Hillary chimes the Trinity, take a look out of a window at your home and notice the rebirth of greenery that has recently appeared. May it represent new life for this season of Easter. So Catherine has um, 
has done a very good job of, of allowing us to enter into a, a space of worship and in your own homes, I invite you um, uh, to think about uh, your living room as your sanctuary and that window that you're looking out to and um, hear these words uh, of gathering. We gather here in a virtual meeting house to worship a loving and remarkable God. In a strange way, it's here in cyberspace that we are most connected to the earliest church. They used what they had available to express their prayers. Palm branches, clapping hands, fish sketched into dusty streets, crusty bread and common wine, the homes of folk who had the largest couches. It wasn't polished. It wasn't rehearsed. It was simply holy. These many years later, we offer what we have. Mobile phones turned makeshift production houses, laptop speakers ambling imperfect projections, and people gathered round their living rooms, just hoping that their bandwidth will keep up. So we say the prayers, and we pass the peace, we sing the songs, and the story continues. It's not polished, it's not rehearsed, it's simply holy. And now, as back then, we take comfort in the presence of a creator who hears us, no matter our medium, who greets us with joy even when we're in pajamas and have bedhead, who calls us by name or texts or pings, uh, who te or text or pings or tweets. Beloved, and just like every Sunday, we claim this worship as a gift, our offering of praise to God and God's offering of community to each one of us. Thanks be to God. We need your presence on the long road, Lord, the road between fear and hope, the road between the place where all is lost and the place of resurrection. Like the disciples walking the road to Emmaus, we are in need of your company. Jesus, stand among us in your risen power. Let this time of worship be a hallowed hour. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you so much for all the ways that you have shown us love and all the ways that you have showed us how to love through the person of Jesus Christ. Be with us during this hour of worship that may, we may respond to your truth, that we may grow in faith. Fill us with hope. Renew our confidence to face life as we face these new situations in which we find ourselves. In the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Once again, welcome to worship at Sardis Baptist. At this time on Zoom, I would like you to open up your chat if you have it or pull out your cell phone. And I want you to type in or text or maybe even call someone you haven't talked to in a minute. And I want you to wish them peace and a good day. So with that, let's pass the peace of Christ. May the peace of God be with you. Also with you. Let's pass God's peace. Before we sing, I'd just like to say that you are a loved and worthy child of God, and I want you to go into this next week with that assurance. Now let's join together in singing Halle, Halle, Halle. We come to our time of morning prayer, and I will uh, pray for some of the needs of the church, and then we'll close with some words from John Philip Newell, uh, an author and um, minister that uh, I, I love. Will you join your prayer with mine. God, our creator, we are joyful this morning as we celebrate the blessing of life. And with life, we remember birthdays of Brantley Rutherford, Elizabeth Mosley, and, and Bill Sholin this week. And Bill Sholin reminds us, we know how much this community means to him. And it certainly is a reminder of how this crisis has affected so many. And we also remember Mary Jane, one of our saints, her birthday would have been tomorrow. And Lord, at this time, we lift up all those prayers that are on our hearts, believing that you will hear them. And then finally, Lord, before us in the planned shape of this day, we look for unexpected surgings of new life around us in the people whom we know and love. We look for unopened gifts of promise within us in the familiar sanctuary of our own soul, we look for shinings of the everlasting light before us, around us, within us. We look for your life-giving mystery, O oh God, before us, around us, within us. Amen. So you're seeing the images on your screen now that Catherine mentioned before. And as we continue to remember this past week of Earth Day, listen to these words by Wendell Berry, The Peace of Wild Things. 
when despair for the world grows in me and I wake in the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be. I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not ta tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting with their light. For a time, I rest in the grace of the world and am free. As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs after you. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. You. shield to you alone may my spirit yield you alone are my heart's desire and i long to worship you you're my friend and you are my brother even though you are a king i love you more than any other so much more than anything you alone are my strength my shield to you desire and I long to worship you. I want you more than gold or silver, only you can satisfy. You alone are the real joy giver and the apple of my eye. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you.
Thank you so much for that music, Hillary, and uh, for your music, Irina, and Tilly and Jonathan and Catherine for, for your prayers, and, and to all of you who are tuning in for your participation to make this uh, uh, a larger act of, of corporate worship. Um, we are grateful that we can gather in this place. Um, I will read our scripture in just a moment, and then we'll follow that with the sermon. I'll remind you um, that copies of, uh, of our main, I think, Actually, Catherine is putting a copy up on the screen, but they're also available on our website and in the church email that was sent out um, earlier today. So our lesson this morning comes from Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. This is the next to last little story uh, in Luke's Gospel. Uh, and hear now these words. 24 verses 13 begins, now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with, with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And Jesus said to them, what are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who, do, who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? Jesus asked them, What things? And the two men replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all of this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that Jesus was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then Jesus said to them, oh, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, Jesus walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So Jesus went in to stay with them. And when Jesus was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were open and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Friends, these are good words for you, a good people. Thanks be to God. This morning's sermon is entitled, Filled with the Spirit. So we're starting at the end, but Luke's gospel begins with a birth narrative. Jesus is eight, is eight days old and is taken to be dedicated in the temple. It's here in the temple that we meet a remarkable pair, Anna and Simeon. We're told that Simeon is a righteous man and that the Holy Spirit rests on him. He's advanced and aged, but the Spirit has told him that he will see the Lord's Messiah in his lifetime. Anna is a prophetess. I hope that word catches your attention. Prophetess categorizes Anna with the likes of Miriam and Deborah, 
which means that Anna is someone you had better listen to. She spends all, all, she spends all day and all night in the temple. And the text doesn't need to tell us that the Holy Spirit rests on her too. Trust me, y'all, it does. At the very moment Anna and Simeon see Jesus, they recognize God's Messiah in their presence. Here in this child is someone who will be a light, one who will illumine and reveal God's purposes to both Jews and Gentiles alike. God's redemption, God's salvation of Jerusalem is at hand, for here is one who will be able to distribute the Holy Spirit on both a macro and a micro level. Now let's fast forward, and Luke's gospel ends with a traveling narrative. On the afternoon of that first Easter, two followers of Jesus, Cleopas among them, who know the eleven well, are making their way back to the village of Emmaus, a suburb of Jerusalem. The walking partners are struggling to make sense of the Passover week events. As they converse, they are joined by a stranger, the resurrected Jesus. Jesus prevents their recognition of him and asks them to tell him of the week's events. Now, I imagine that these men are a bit younger than Anna and Simeon, so they don't have some of the wisdom that comes with age. But unlike their elder counterparts, the two travelers have extensive knowledge and familiarity of Jesus. They know that Jesus is a prophet. They've been in community with Jesus. They have sought to be his disciple. Still, even with all of that exposure and familiarity, they don't yet know Jesus like Anna and Simeon do. They don't yet view Jesus through the lens of the Spirit. More than anything, the two men, as well as the disciples, have pictured what Jesus' Messiahship will be. They've imagined what a restored Jerusalem will look like. And for these men, they don't expect this Jerusalem to come with a humiliating death, a heavy grief, and the injustices of Rome right outside their door. It's been three days, and they expect a heroic warrior to topple the current system and restore the glories of David's Israel, tales of which excited them in their childhood. And to add insult to injury, Mary and some of the other women of their group have reported an empty tomb, and they have seen visions of their teacher. But when Peter and a few other men went to see for themselves, they only saw the empty tomb. Jesus didn't appear to the men. Jesus is listening to two witnesses to his ministry that are not yet able to process what they've seen. At this point in the story, I imagine Jesus, patient as he is, wants to shake some sense or maybe shake some spirit into his neophytes. How many signs do you need? I'm standing right before you. And I appeared to Mary because unlike each of you men, she has shown initiative. She was up and at him at dawn while you all were still sleeping. But Jesus doesn't shake them, even if they are overcooking his grits a little bit. That's kind of one of the things that makes Jesus, Jesus. Instead, Jesus goes into teaching mode. He implores his new friends to remember the whole arc of scriptures. He recounts the stories of the prophets from Moses on through the ages. He reminds them of all the things that God's servants must endure. That's the joy and the pain and the suffering and all the experiences of life in order to fulfill the glory that will follow. And as Jesus is talking, it's like time stops. The disciples drink up his teachings, so much so that they hardly notice they've walked seven miles. It's like they've swallowed a good novel. The words have their full attention, and they are all that matters. The three walkers arrive in Emmaus at supper time. Cleopas and his companion invite their new friend to join them for dinner. At the table, Jesus takes, breaks, and blesses bread. Three motions similar to what he did at Passover and in the miracle of the feeding of 5,000. 
And here's what I think is really interesting about today's text. There are so many similarities with this story to other Easter witness stories. On Easter morning, our text told us that Mary Magdalene recognizes Jesus at the precise moment he calls her name. In some way, Jesus' naming of Mary is an assertion of her inherent value, as well as a catalyst in evoking her deep connection toward him. Hearing God call her name is Mary's resurrection moment. Last week, even though it wasn't the text we preached, John's gospel recounted the story of Thomas. And I'm speculating here, but I imagine that Thomas was a hugger or at least a handshaker. What I mean to say by this is that I think Thomas felt a kindred connection to Jesus and the others in the group in the sharing of physical space and touch. And that resonates with me in this age of Corona because I like to hug the people I love too. And for me, I don't think that Thomas is going to believe or perhaps experience belief until Thomas sees, hears, and touches Jesus for himself. When Jesus invites Thomas to touch his hands and his sides, Thomas replies, my Lord and my God. This week, it's not the hearing, nor the seeing, nor the touching, nor is it the fulfillment of prophecy that evokes images of resurrection for Cleopas and his companion. Instead, it's the sharing of a meal. When Jesus breaks the bread and looks his friends in his eyes and he says, hey, y'all, you know something? I am really glad that you're at the table with me. They are instantly reconnected to his spirit of hospitality. And it's still true. When we gather in Christ's name, acting with the same sense of love and generosity that he offered others, when we allow ourselves to be both host and guest at any table, Jesus is present. Finally, I don't think that the last few verses of today's text should be overlooked. The very moment that Cleopas and his friend experienced the resurrected Jesus, they leave to share the good news with others. This is in keeping with Mary, who ran with joy to tell the others, and with Thomas, whom tradition tells us was the first person to share the story of Jesus in India. And later that evening, when Cleopas and his companion finally rendezvous with the disciples and others in Jerusalem, they learn that Jesus has appeared to Peter as well. Now, I know, I know, I know. Our lection is supposed to be one story, today's story. And here I've gone and told you about six different experiences of people encountering and recognizing Jesus as Messiah, that one who will resurrect and redeem and restore the lives of God's people. But you see, that's the thing. All of these stories are connected to one another and to us as well. Yes. Yes, of course, our individual encounters with the resurrected Christ are important. We are all unique, and therefore we experience and encounter and, and process our connections with Jesus in very different ways. But when we share with one another the varied and unique ways in which Jesus appears, we offer greater accessibility for all of God's creatures to encounter their own sense of resurrection in the story of Jesus. Maybe this morning, you feel invisible. Perhaps Jesus will call your name. Maybe this morning, you feel isolated, cut off from the world. Perhaps Jesus will offer you an embrace. Maybe this morning, you need space and companionship at a table. Perhaps Jesus will break some bread with you. Maybe in the presence of Jesus, you see God's realm bursting into Caesars, and you've just got to tell others how that feels. I think that sometimes we get too caught up in the mechanics of the Easter story. We turn ourselves inside out, trying to reckon how we might react to seeing the risen Christ fresh out of a tomb. 
In so doing, we lose sight of what this mysterious transformation really does. Somehow, some way, the spirit, that is the substance of God, made known in the life, ministry, and teachings of Jesus, is something that can also be revealed in each one of us. And so my mind drifts back to Anna and Simeon because I have a hunch that when they saw the baby Jesus, they were seeing more than a child and more than the life of a man and more than a political restoration. I think they were seeing forward, seeing forward into a future, into days where the spirit would take hold of an entire city. This morning, in today's text, we're witnessing the beginning of a metamorphosis. The inner circle now believes, and they are sharing revelations of belief steeped in God's spirit with one another. Over the next 40 days, Jesus will equip them to receive the Holy Spirit in a more formal way. And on the day of Pentecost, an entire city speaking in a thousand tongues and whirling with the flames and winds of God's spirit will birth a new kind of resurrection. The church. If we are to honor such a resurrection, I think it means making Sardis Baptist Church and all of God's churches a place where hearing your name a place where embracing your friends, a place where breaking bread together, a place where sharing our witness of God's presence are all catalysts for revealing a living, transformative God for all of those folks who still feel like they are living out the darkness, the finality, and the tragedy of Friday and Saturday. Anna and Simeon. Mary and Thomas, Cleopas and an associate, Peter and others whose names we do not know, discovered the resurrected Jesus by resurrecting the very things Jesus did to give them hope. They embraced his presence. They looked into the hearts of their friends. They called people by their names. They discerned the scriptures with one another, gleaning insight from everyone's perspective. They broke bread with one another. They told truth, good needed truth about how encounters with the risen Christ had transformed their very beings. But more than anything, they gathered together, nurturing a spirit that lives on in every age, be it one of occupation, be it one of renaissance, be it one of prosperity, be it one of uncertainty, be it one of coronavirus. And if we are really paying attention today, Luke's gospel and its sequel, The Acts of the Apostle, are still being written right here in this place by women and men who seek to follow the one who gives us life. Friends, may God continue to give us the resolve to gather in community, however creatively, in order that we too, may seek and find God's transforming, God's resurrecting, God's everlasting spirit. Amen. Sorry, I wanted to see if I could see more of you before I offer an invitation. Um, So each week uh, we gather together, uh, whether in person or virtually, uh, and we offer an invitation to this place called Sardis. Uh, We wanna continue that tradition. If uh, if you are looking for a church home uh, where you can gather, uh, and hear tales of how God's spirit uh, is impacting and, and prompting and, and provoking and prodding uh, our community uh, to be what God calls us to be. We invite you to such a place. Look here, I was so, I was so um, convincing that I got a convert. Um, 
if you are looking for a church home, we just want to say we welcome you to this place and we invite you to be a part of all that we are. We also want to remind you that when we, when we offer an invitation, it's not just to those who've made a formal profession of faith or who have made a formal commitment to this specific community of faith. If God is calling you in some way, if God's spirit is provoking you in some way, we would love to hear all about it. We remind you that this invitation is not fixed in time, but is available every day of the week. Uh, and even though we're on Zoom, text us, Facebook us, Twitter us, tweet us, I think is the right way to say it. Uh, be in touch with us because we want to hear how God is invested in your lives. Um, I'm going to offer a, a benediction for us. Um, if there's something you want to respond with in the chat box, we encourage you to do that. <laughs> After... <laughs> After, um, after we offer that, um, that benediction, uh, Irene is gonna, gonna play a, a short piece for us and then we'll invite you in, into community with one another. Um, so hear this as a blessing as you either go about your day or go to your nap, I think, right? You wanna hear the blessing? Yes, okay. So hear this as a blessing as you go, friends. May God's spirit swirl all around you and leave you with a grin. And may that grin turn into a smile. And may that smile turn into an act of kindness. And together, we will be a chorus of love, empowered to be the hands of Christ in our community. Good friends, go now with God's blessing and in God's peace, and most especially with God's joy. <laughs> I will unmute us all so that we can greet one another. Oh. Hello, everyone. Hey, everybody. Hello. 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 Good morning. Hello, Hello everybody. Hello, Hal. Thank you, Hillary. Melissa. Hello, Kristen and Jeff. Yay. Hello. 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 Hey, David and Donna. Hey, hey Howell. Hey, Lucy. 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 Hey, Lucy.